Welcome back. In our last lecture, we explored some powerful examples of persuasive or evocative writing, intriguing wordplay, the importance of tone and knowing your audience, and the strength that mastery of a particular form, such as the essay, can give your writing. In the exercises that I wrote to accompany lecture one, you were given three passages to try and analyze, not in any sort of in-depth way. What I was asking for there was a sort of first impression as to what makes the writing particularly good or engaging. For example, in the first quote that I gave you in the exercises in the guidebook, this was from James Joyce's Araby, and you might have been struck by how the word choice and description gave an impression of gloominess or loneliness. There was the description of a room being full of, quote, old, useless papers. The garden was called wild, a word in opposition to the careful order we usually associate with the idea of a garden. There was the, quote, rusty bicycle pump found underneath some, quote, few straggling bushes. All of this phrasing conveying a sense of neglect or abandonment. From Joyce's careful word choice and phrasing, the scene is set. His precision, which subtly conveys the tone of the scene, is what makes this, arguably, good writing. Now, maybe you didn't even get as far as identifying key words and phrases. Maybe you only read each of the passages and jotted down or thought something like, I like this because I get a strong sense of the place where it's happening, or I don't like this passage, it makes me feel sad. If that's as far as you got, that is just fine, especially for your very first time attempting to analyze a piece of writing. Now, reactions such as I like it or I don't like it are excellent places to start, but you don't want to stop there. These initial reactions are what I call pre-critical responses. The difference between a reader who is simply interested and one who is deeply engaged can be found in if and how those readers move beyond those pre-critical responses to think about how and why a particular piece of writing affects you in certain ways. Moving beyond the pre-critical can allow you to appreciate even writing that you might not really like. It can help you recognize the writer's skill, it can help you to appreciate the effort the writer made, and it can cause you to admire the emotions he or she is able to make you feel, even if you don't like the emotions, even if you find the process of reading that piece of text unpleasant. For example, I greatly admire the writer Henry James, whose style is famously very dense, it's full of subclauses, and it requires deep concentration to fully understand the range of his artistic skill. But if you were to ask me if I like the writing of Henry James, the answer would be a resounding no. At the other end of the spectrum, there are some modern writers of mysteries or thrillers whom I consider to be absolutely atrocious, clumsy writers, and they don't have really any sense of style, and they have what I think of as a tin ear when it comes to realistic dialogue. But at the same time, that might be exactly the kind of book I'd like to read if I'm lying on a beach somewhere. So, let's talk about a pre-critical response and then how you can move beyond it so that you can become a more engaged reader. And remember, as I've said before, the key to becoming a competent writer lies first in being an attentive reader. So let's take a famous passage and see what we can make out of it. Here are the opening lines of Herman Melville's classic, Moby Dick. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, 
whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to see as soon as I can. Now, whenever I teach Moby Dick, I always ask students to give me an initial pre-critical response to this passage. I want them to think about what feelings or emotions this passage gave them as I read it aloud. Some students tell me, I liked it, or I didn't get what he was saying half the time, or I thought it was funny. And sometimes I'm always happy to get a student who says, I'm excited to read the rest. Now, those are all pre-critical responses. So let's move past them and find out, using critical skills of engagement, why you might have any one of those reactions and how we can use those reactions as a starting point to achieve a deeper understanding of the text. Let's start with those of you who responded with some version of, I liked it. Okay, why did you like it? Well, for one thing, if I was going to answer that question for you, I would say there's something powerful about the use of the first person and direct address. And the first three words of this text convey that this will be a work that does both. Call me Ishmael. The writer or speaker, however we might imagine him, is talking directly to you, his audience, and telling you what to do. He goes on from there to tell you something about himself in the first person. When I do this, then I feel that. We're going to get up close and personal with the teller of this tale, and this writing in the first person can be one of the easiest and most effective ways to grab your reader's attention. We all like to hear stories, and generally speaking, a first-person narrative gives us a deeply personal account that can be especially enthralling in that it allows us to see into the mind of another person. All right, but what about a more negative pre-critical response? I didn't get what he was saying half the time. Okay, well, let's think about why that may be. Those of us living in 21st century America probably don't have any idea what hypos are, nor do we commonly, commonly come across coffin warehouses or funeral processions into which you could easily join. And very few people wear hats these days, so the idea of expressing your unhappiness or discontent by stepping into the street and knocking them off of people's heads just seems bizarre. But we can learn something important from this seeming disorientation. It tells us that we are in a world that is not 21st century America. And the very strangeness of the narrator's attitude and behavior in relationship to our modern sensibilities helps contribute to a sense of having escaped to a different time and place. And by the way, hypos is probably a contracted form of hypochondria, and it means something like the narrator's in a bad mood, or he's depressed, or sad, or melancholy. So finally, the tone style and this wry comment on hypos and knocking people's hats off their heads also has a little bit of something that's humorous about it. At the very least, we know we're in for a story that's not going to be totally devoid of a few light moments that might even provoke a laugh or two. Okay, let's take a different example, and this one from a time and place that's even further removed from our modern one. This passage is from Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, and it's one of the most important versions of the legend of King Arthur to be written before the modern period. And it also happens to be my particular scholarly area of specialty. This text comes from the end of the 15th century, and it's written in the Middle English of that period. Now, if I were to try and read it in the original Middle English, the spelling and syntax would look rather strange on the page, and the first lines would sound something like this. Then the king established all the knictis and gave them riches and londes, and charged them never to do outrage nor their murder, and always to flay treason, and to give mercy unto him that asketh mercy upon pine of forfeiture of their worship and lordship of King Arthur forevermore. 
Okay, so what's your first reaction upon hearing those lines? Well, with the case of Moby Dick, likewise, you're at least certainly struck with a strong impression that we are in a time and place that's really different from the present. Even if you did not understand a word of what I said, you at least have been able to gather that one crucial piece of information. And from this one piece of information, that we're far in the past, that we're not in the present, you can begin to build a deeper, more insightful understanding of the place, time, and values of the story. Those lines I just read to you begin what is known as the Pentecostal Oath. And it's called this because King Arthur's knights swear every year at the Feast of Pentecost to obey the rules of the Pentecostal Oath. The translation, which will be easier for you to understand, would sound something like this. Then the king established all his knights and bestowed on them riches and lands. He charged them never to commit outrage or murder, always to flee treason, and to give mercy to those who asked for mercy upon pain of the forfeiture of their honor and status as a knight of King Arthur's forevermore. He charged them always to help ladies, damsels, gentlewomen, and widows, and never to commit rape upon pain of death. Also, he commanded that no man should take up a battle in a wrongful quarrel, not for love, nor for any worldly goods. Now, as I noted a moment ago, this world may seem even more alien and strange to us than that described at the beginning of Moby Dick. And so it's even harder, maybe, to find a way past a pre-critical response. A lot of us might be inclined to say simply, I am not really sure what is going on here, but I know this is not my world. But if we read carefully, we can learn something about the society depicted here. First, money and land are important, and when a king wants to reward his loyal followers, this is what he gives them. If we read even more closely, we recognize that, in fact, he gives this as a reward in advance. So he gives these possessions to his followers as a sort of future promise of their loyalty. So already, even if we don't understand anything else, we can tell that this is a world where honoring those who have committed to follow you is a big deal. Next, we can see that honor is an important element of this society. Knights should not commit outrageous deeds or murder. And the suggestion here would be that there must be some kind of killing that's not murder, that's rightful killing, which is interesting. Um, also important, compassion and mercy. These are two more important character elements of a noble knight. The line about helping women suggests something similar. It's a very chivalric noble attitude. One has to fight on behalf of women because presumably in this time and place, they cannot fight for themselves. On the other hand, this gallant sort of phrase or rule to always help ladies is kind of undone by the line about never committing rape. Generally speaking, the only reason to instruct someone explicitly not to do something is because that very thing is in fact being done. In other words, you don't need to tell right knights not to rape women unless some of them are in fact doing just that. In fact, the first printer of Mallory's text, William Caxton, deleted that line from his 1485 edition. He wanted to sell copies of a book that people enjoyed because it told stories of noble knights doing fantastic deeds. And a lot of people who bought his book were not nobles. They were members of classes below the nobility, like the merchants, who wanted to read books like Mallory's in order to learn how to dress, how to talk, and how to act in a noble fashion. The line about never raping women would have totally marred the enjoyment of a lot of those people who had a particular idealized image of the court of King Arthur in their minds and who wanted to sort of be associated with or like the noble classes. And finally, the last line of the Pentecostal Oath again emphasizes and clarifies the importance of wealth and property in this society. Although, Obviously, it's honorable to reward your followers with land and riches. And of course, it's honorable to provide those things in advance. It's obviously dishonorable to engage in conflict solely for material gain. And it's also dishonorable to fight on behalf of one's lord or the woman you're in love with if the quarrel is not a just or a righteous quarrel. 
So while personal loyalty is important, it's trumped by the nature of the dispute. In other words, while you certainly should protect your lady love and fight for her rights, you should not do this if she wants you to do something less than honorable. Okay, so through careful reading, what at first seemed like a rather impenetrable passage can in fact provide us with several ways into the text, a kind of hook, so that we can get into the work and try and understand something about the setting of the story and the characters who inhabit it. So let's try this exercise again, and this time let's try it with an excerpt from the beginning of James Joyce. Uh, as you can tell, he's one of my favorite writers, you're probably starting to gather. We're going to talk about the opening of James Joyce's story, The Boarding House, and here's how it begins. Breakfast was over in the boarding house, and the table of the breakfast room was covered with plates on which ye lay yellow streaks of eggs with morsels of bacon fat and bacon rind. Mrs. Mooney sat in the straw armchair and watched the servant Mary remove the breakfast things. She made Mary collect the crusts and pieces of broken bread to help make Tuesday's bread pudding. When the table was cleared, the broken bread collected, the sugar and butter safe under lock and key, she began to reconstruct the interview which she had had the night before with Polly. Okay, so what immediately are the things that leap to mind when you consider this passage? Well, some of you probably right away noticed this huge emphasis on food and the way it's described. There are streaks of eggs, there are morsels of bacon, there are crusts and leftover pieces of bread and sugar and butter. Now the mention of the food itself suggests plenty. Um, some people just ate a full breakfast with all the trimmings. But at the same time, you have these juicy nouns, morsels, streaks, and this reference also to the collecting crusts of bread instead of throwing them away and locking up the sugar and butter. And this indicates a really careful concern of resources. So is Mrs. Mooney, the question becomes, just a practical, efficient housekeeper? Or is she in dire economic straits and this necessitates that she's really careful with saving food and conserving as much as she can? What clues help us answer this question? Well, you probably noticed a few other details and you're probably answering this question in your minds right now. For one, she herself is not doing any of the actual work here. I'm sure you probably all picked up on the fact that she's sitting in an armchair while she watches her servant, Mary, performing these tasks. The fact that she has a servant, that she sits and observes while not performing any actual work herself, in combination with the food references that are somewhat contradictory, there's a careful assessment of resources and a fanatical attention to crumbs and morsels. Well, all of this together, I think, conveys a slightly more negative impression than we might have gotten if we just read it through once and hadn't really considered the passage. So if you get the sense by now that Mrs. Mooney is miserly and she's calculating and perhaps even a little mercenary, you would not be far wrong. For indeed, as the story progresses, we learn that Mrs. Mooney has ruthlessly manipulated her daughter Polly and one of the boarders living in the boarding house in order to ensure a decent marriage for her daughter. And this was something that was potentially difficult to secure for members of their particular social class. So what she's done is orchestrate a situation to make sure that Polly makes a good marriage. And in doing this, she probably makes sure that her future financial situation is more secure than it would have been. So from these examples, brief as they are, you've already learned a little something about insightful reading and how it can enhance our understanding and our enjoyment of the written word. And if you recognize powerful, clever, nuanced moments in a variety of written texts as a reader, you'll soon start to be able to work these into your own writing. And once you start reading texts insightfully, you'll start to notice the world around you can be read as a kind of text. You'll understand that pretty much anything can be a text, 
anything can be open to a wide variety of kinds of interpretation and any text itself, even if it's not fiction, any text can be a kind of story. So let's take what would be considered probably the most mundane of examples of writing. Let's consider some directions from one place to another. Suppose you need to tell someone visiting you from out of town how to get to the post office from your house. Here's how the written directions might read. They might say something like, take a left out of the driveway and then take a right on Jones Street. Go straight for about a quarter of a mile and say, turn left on Smith. The post office will be about half a mile down on your right. Okay, and after hearing that example, you're probably thinking, well, there's nothing that can be gained from reading insightfully here, right? So why should I bother? But if we consider those directions given to the same location, but given by a different person, you'll start to see a difference. So let's imagine that if someone else were giving directions to the same place, they might say, turn left out the driveway and then go right at the big yellow house. After crossing over the train tracks, turn left at the street corner with a fire station on the corner. Okay, what's the difference here? Well, when we compare these two, we can immediately recognize a difference in the way each of the writers or speakers understands the world around him or her. One of them is thinking in terms of signs or distances. Go left at this street, go this far while the second writer has a different kind of mind. Maybe he or she doesn't even know the names of the streets on which you're supposed to turn. The second writer or speaker looks not at road signs or the speedometer, but at landmarks, recognizable buildings, train tracks, etc. And so if you really stop to think about it, in a way, each of these sets of directions tells a little story about the person who's giving them. And in fact, all writing can be a kind of storytelling. And it would be helpful for us to consider here the difference between the written and the spoken word. Because if you ask someone to tell you how to get someplace, as opposed to writing it down, the response is really going to be different. So for example, if you ask someone to tell you how to get to the post office, that response might be, so come out of the driveway and hang a left. And here, as I'm doing right now, the speaker might make a hand gesture, go to the left. Then you make a right, another hand gesture. You'll go for a while and you'll cross some train tracks. And here you might get a speaker doing a little overhand motion over the train tracks. And well, you get the point. So which set of directions would you rather get? If we try to think about the differences between these, many of us might say they prefer the spoken directions. Why is this? Well, for one thing, the gestures I've just been making and describing can be helpful in figuring out exactly where it is you need to go. Also, some details are easier to convey when they're spoken rather than when they're written. And in the spoken set of directions, you're there to ask questions. You can get some clarification. You can request additional details. You, if you're confused, you can ask someone to give you more information. This is always a useful thing to remember when you're composing your own writing. With the written word, your audience can't immediately interact with you in the present moment. And so you have to be very careful and clear. Above all, you should always strive for clarity. You should anticipate questions or moments of confusion. And you should also always consider the self-image you're conveying to your audience. How are they going to interpret you and your personality based on what you've written? Because even in something as mundane as a set of directions from one place to another, you are creating a writerly or authorial persona. Now, obviously, there are also elements that make the written directions more desirable than the spoken ones. For one, you can refer to the written directions repeatedly as you make your way from the house to the post office. So keeping all the details in your memory is an essential. As you're driving, you can check at the written directions in your hand, look up, check the street signs, look down again. So you have something to refer to to help you along. I often think of the writer Lee Smith, who in an interview once described what it was like growing up in a town full of natural storytellers. In her town, she said, if you ask someone how to get to the post office, 
you might get a set of spoken instructions like, go down here, take a left, and you'll see it on your right. Or you could get something like, I had a cousin who went to the post office once, got bit by a mad dog. Okay, so the second set of directions might be interesting if you have all the time in the world and would like to hear about the cousin who got bitten by the mad dog before you get your directions. But probably most of us would prefer something a little clearer, a little more succinct, and a little more to the point. But once again, just those two sentences. I had a cousin who went to the post office once, got bit by a mad dog. Whether they're spoken or written, they function as a kind of text. And if we read or interpret it insightfully, we can actually learn quite a bit that can deepen and enhance our understanding of this particular text or this particular statement and its speaker slash writer. Now, if we stop and consider the work we've done in this lecture, whether it's in our discussion of literary texts or a set of directions, you may realize that a piece of writing has several lives, at least two, and potentially many more. And this is something that people aren't always aware of, and it's really something that you should be thinking of as you are working on your own writing. The first life of a piece of writing is when you read it the first time, when you experience it as a brand new text that you've never encountered before. The second life of a piece of writing occurs when you consider and then reflect on what it is you've just read. You may think of words that struck you in particular or certain details and whether the piece is written in the first or the third person, said in the past or the present, or any one of several other aspects. So that would be the second life of a text. Now, the third, and to my mind, arguably the most interesting life of the text, is this last one. And after you've read it once, reflected on the text, and then you read it again. When you read through it again, you come to the text armed with your pre-critical response and perhaps a few insights that you've gleaned from your initial read-through. This third life of the text is when you can really start to apply what we've discussed today in terms of insightful reading. So what else can we take away from today's lecture? Well, one thing that probably all of us have recognized or known instinctively but haven't quite consciously been aware of until today is that anything can be a text and almost anything can be read or interpreted insightfully, from long acclaimed works of literature to the most mundane set of directions from one place to another. Spoken words also constitute a kind of text. And another thing that we focused on consciously again today is the difference between the spoken and the written word. Certainly any number of societies had lively, complex, and fascinating traditions of historical memory and storytelling before they had writing. But the written word is in so many ways so very different from the spoken one, not least of all because the written word goes on to have a life of its own. And this life can be so many different things than would be the case with words that are spoken in the moment. And the major point that we explored over and over again today is how to find a way into a text that might seem initially impossible to find your way into. How do you move beyond your pre-critical response and read insightfully so that you can deepen both your understanding and your enjoyment of the text? In turn, the practice of insightful reading can help make you a better writer. Exploring the writer's craft from one perspective ultimately can help make you a better practitioner of that craft. So in our next lecture, we're going to continue our exploration of what it means to be an engaged reader by deepening our understanding of literary forms and genres. One of the basics of engaging with writing is to understand the genre or type of writing it is. An awareness of how expectations of style and subject matter fit with a piece's perceived genre can help you become much more keenly attuned to your own writing and help you to pay attention to considerations like the expectations of your audience. In the next lecture, we'll learn to recognize different genres, focusing on five major types of writing that are common today. Prose, poetry, drama, essay, and autobiography. We'll explore the dominant features of each 
and then learn how understanding and recognizing and using that knowledge can make us better readers and thus better writers.